Greetings fellow loon lovers. My name is James Longo and I'm the Lakes Region Biologist for the Loon Preservation Committee coming to you live from New Hampshire. I'll be taking you through a little snapshot of a day of a life in, of a loon biologist and today on the docket we have a post-hatch nest and I'll explain more about what that means as we go. First, a little bit about the nest. This is a little bit of a hybrid nest, half half human made. One of the features that you may be able to see, if I could get out of the way here, is this tube, which is installed by senior biologist Cooley to help the nest raft float. Early season, where the adult loons when building the nest, the material kept sinking and they kept building more. And we like to make an effort when we can, when in an area where past nests have tended to fail, increase the productivity. And another addition here that isn't quite natural are these saplings above the nest. These are designed to help reduce aerial predation, namely in the case of eagles. So, next, do is collect the eggshells. So while I'm doing so, I'm going to explain a little bit of why we collect the eggshells. And there's a few different purposes depending on the situation. One, in the situation where we uh, assume predation, Collecting the eggshells and getting a general state of what is going on around the nest can help us indicate what, what will cause the predation or what other cause may have caused the nest to fail. And, but in this case, as avid viewers of the v nest cam will know, we had two successful chicks hatch from this egg, from these eggs. So the purpose of collecting eggshells from eggs that we know successfully hatched is that we can still monitor the level of contaminants in the mother. Because contaminants that are in the mother are transmitted directly through the egg. So the things we're looking for mostly are mercury and lead. Lead poisoning being one of the leading causes of loon mortality in New Hampshire, unfortunately. Um, and on the pond, about, uh, about an over an hour now and had a chance to view the parents that are on the pond and they're foraging well. The mother was taking care of the two chicks and the father was foraging and they looked, they looked happy about it. We're all happy about it and that's good. That's what we like to see. So I'm going to actually hop on the nest the rest of these um, eggshells and it's also going to give you an opportunity to see just how squishy these nests are. Look how deep this is. I'm up to my knees in this. So the reason I'm using gloves is because contaminants may run off on my hands onto the eggshells and it could throw off the precision of the lead in loons. The way that loons typically ingest lead is through fishing tackle. Namely, old sinkers or jigs will have been made of lead just because it's a cheaper material. And loons will swallow those, oftentimes when they swallow the fish which have, sw which have swallowed the lead tackle. And it is nearly always fatal to the loon. Just last week we had, a, unfortunately, a lead loon. And how you can identify a lead loon would be extreme lethargia. They'll hang out on the shore of a beach and um, they won't move for hours at a time. They'll be very weak. And so if you see that, that's something that's very important to call and report immediately to the Loon Preservation Committee because that information will allow us to come and hopefully rescue the loon, but in most cases, unfortunately not. The best thing that you can do to help prevent that is to, if you know a fisherman, especially older fishermen who maybe keep around old tackle that they have, to replace all their tackle because legislation has changed in the past few years and lead fishing tackle has become mostly illegal. So if you're fishing out your tackle from your old tackle, you should be good and you should feel good about not killing the loons. So now here's a little demonstration of how squishy this is. This is the material that the loons like to nest on. 
a little a little trampoline like a little trampoline like is how I describe it. Okay. So now that we have the eggshells, we'll bring that back to the lab and like I said, we'll test it for contaminants such as mercury and lead. And collecting the eggshells throughout the state of all the hatched and unhatched, we can come up with a little map of lead and mercury conditions. And with that information, perhaps we can find them and target them. And kind of predict in the future what areas we should be looking out for lead. That's about what we have for that. I'm going to open the floor to any questions you may have about loons or other things that I do with my the Loon Preservation Committee in general. Our techie Bill is up on the shore. They're going to be looking at the chat, and he'll be yelling down at me the questions that you ask. And there's a little bit of a delay, so um, I'll wait for that to come in if there are any questions. Other than that, thank you for watching me mock and help the loons. Oh yes, I forgot, yeah. So the female here is since was banded in 1998, so we can't say much about her before then because she wasn't differentiable from the other loons, but that means that she is older than I am, so I'm studying a loon that is older than I am. Since that time in 1998, these two chicks which hatch successfully make her 19th and 20th successful egg hatch. So she's part of a core group of loons who are really helping to sustain the New Hampshire population, but it's <laughs> it is interesting studying some birds that are older than I am. But yeah, they were foraging well in Middle P. Um, the two little chicks following behind the female. I saw the male come along. He was foraging off to the side while the female was helping the chicks, and the male came over at one point and shared some of the fish which he had caught with the mother, which was great to see. Coming from well, <laughs> unfortunately, I was born with a very bad sense of smell, but I'll give it a try. I mean, like I said, I'm the I'm one of the worst people to be doing that, but it smells a little earthy. Not not strong in the sense that there would be like a when there's a dead egg on the nest, you can smell that. That's a that's a pungent smell, but um, to my nose. No. Uh, with the uh, uh, health restrictions, how is LPC uh, going out examining the various nests around the state? Oh, uh, in, in regards to the COVID? Yeah, how, how, are you, how are you dealing with that? Well, being out in a kayak in the middle of the lake is one of the most socially distant places and things you could be doing, so that's nice. But in general, the biggest ramification it's had on my position would be the fact that it's harder to take boat rides from volunteers. So on larger lakes, especially the ones over a thousand acres, um, you know, riding on a boat with volunteers is not socially distant. So I've had to kayak a lot more than I would have in previous years. And it's unfortunate that I haven't been able to meet a lot of the volunteers in person. It's a lot more contact over email and phone, but I'm just grateful that the position still exists, that we're still able to do the work. I know there's a lot of research and science that has been halted this summer because of COVID-19, and that's unfortunate, but I'm grateful that the Loon Preservation Committee is continuing their work. So what, what puts uh, mercury in the water, and, and how do you test for that? Uh, well, how we test for that, I'm not quite sure. That's more of the question for the vets. I just bring them the materials, and they do their lab science with it. But I believe it's from just industrial industrialization, kind of um, when things were manufactured with mercury. And the problem is that even though it's not manufactured or put into the environment quite so much anymore, when it was, it's not. It doesn't biodegrade very quickly. So, and we don't have fantastic methods for 
getting mercury in the water. So at a time when nobody cared how much mercury we were putting in the water, that's all still there in Squam Lake and Winnipesaukee and whatnot. So the next question is a, a bit of information about the Niagara control habits of a loon from a river. Mm -hmm. So when loons are born, they'll go back to the ocean, which is where they spend most of their life. It's actually a lot more useful to think of a loon as an ocean bird rather than a lake bird. This is just a like a summer vacation to them. So when they when they hatch, they'll grow, they'll go back to the ocean where they'll stay for about three years until they reach adulthood. And they're out on the water essentially that whole time. They're fishing, they're in, out in the ocean, not very far from the shore. And then come springtime, if they're ready for adulthood, they'll fly back to around the same area where they were born. That's why we tend to get a lot of the same loons in New Hampshire that we've had in the past. And they'll make very long journeys. They're good migrators. They'll go hundreds of miles in one flight, no stop, from the ocean to the lake that they're, that they're aiming to go to. So they're pretty impressive flyers. Somebody wonders what you're doing there, so maybe just to describe what happened as the, you know, after the chicks uh, left, and then at, at the moment that's the last question. Okay, so what I'm doing here is, if you haven't caught, if you aren't an avid watcher of the Loon Cam, I recommend you go to the Loon Preservation Committee YouTube channel, and they've clipped a lot of the exciting parts, but um, since this nest is so well monitored, we know that the Loon successfully hatched two chick eggs, or two chicks. And so now what we're interested in is the level of contaminants in the adults, which we can infer from the egg. The contaminants such as lead and mercury in the mother loon will be passed directly into the egg. And so we collect all the eggshells that we can from every nest across New Hampshire, uh, measure the amount of contaminants, and then we can map that spatially across the state. And so then we find information like hot spots. Are the lakes in this area, is there more lead there? then perhaps that's something we need to address, or more of this chemical in this area, we can do that. And other things, more subtle things like egg thickness could have to do with the diet or the general vitality of the adult, which we've seen go down over a long, like decades, long time period, we've seen the eggshell thickness go down. So a lot of the more vets and the more laboratory type scientists will study that sort of stuff and find how we can address that. and how that can help bolster the loon population. Okay, uh, I think that's it for questions. Uh, we'll wrap it up and then we'll, uh, we'll shut down the camera for, for the rest of the year. All right, thank you very much. Well then that's it for here. If you're interested in seeing some loons which are currently nesting, there is the LPC Loon Cam 2, which they've been nesting for probably about, what is it, a week and a half now? So 28 days from egg lay to egg hatch. It's been about two, two to three weeks, I suppose. Tune back into the Loon Camp 2 if you want to watch a, a hatch. That's exciting. Subscribe to the LPC YouTube channel. There's tons of exciting clips there. And keep an eye out for the loons. And if you see people badgering the loons and going near the loons, they don't want that. That's not, that, that shouldn't be our relationship. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you for being an ally to the loons. Happy birding.